diabetes as well as kidney disease. These are the very low LDL targets. Um, and um, these are some of the important changes in the recommendations. Acetamide is now a class 1A indication uh, in addition to statins if the goals are not reached. Furthermore, the PCSK9 inhibitors are recommended in high risk patients uh, if the goals are not reached with statins and acetamide. And now there's also a further decrease in LTL below 40 milligram per deciliter when a second cardiovascular event happens in patients uh, with cardiovascular disease in a certain time frame. And furthermore, for the high TG levels now, the statins have a class 1A indication. Ha, what are the basics uh, for these new very low LDL goals? Uh, these are mainly the three studies I will focus on later. Moreover, Ivis studies demonstrated that with the LDL of 70 milligram per deciliter, you might stop the black progression. And with the LDL below 55, you might even achieve a regression of the blood burden. Clinically, we know from many studies, here are the results from about 200 patients, that especially in patients uh, with a very high risk, a marked LDA, LDL reduction leads to a substantial reduction in cardiovascular events. But how is the reality? A cross-sectional <clears throat> European study that Da Vinci Vetristi shows that the vast majority of patients did neither achieve the treatment goals in 2016, this is a solid bars, nor in 2000, 2019, these are the dashboards. How can we become better? We have several new treatment options I will discuss, discuss with you in the following slides. However, with the more potent statins like esrosuvastatin and atorvastatin, we can already do a very good job with LDL reduction up to 55%. With esetimibe compared uh, with simvastatin several years ago, an LDL of 54 milligram per deciliter compared to 70 milligram per deciliter with uh, that time simvastatin alone was achieved in the improve its study in patients after an acute coronary syndrome. And it could be shown that especially in patients with a very high risk profile, that these patients did benefit from these very low LDLOs. We get now new treatment options thereafter with the so-called PCSK9 inhibitors. Here uh, you see the complicated term for this abbreviation. How do they act? The LDL receptors bind to LDL and uh, remove the LDL particles. Recycled LDL receptors then return to the cell surface to repeat this process. PCSK9 binds to the LDL receptor and promotes their degradation. Inhibiting PCSK9 increases the availability for the LDL receptor to move again the LDL cholesterol from the circulation. You see this came here on the left side. Uh, in the presence of the PCSK9 PCS receptor, um, PCSK9, the LDL receptor, is degraded in the lysosome. But in the presence of an inhibitor, this LDL receptor can be recycled and returned then to the surface to bind more and new LDL cholesterol. There are two landmark studies showing that this worked. The Fourier trial with evolusumab decreased the mean LDL to 30 milligram per deciliter over a period of about three years leading to a 15% reduction in the primary endpoint. The Odyssey's outcome trial with aliorzumab showed a marked reduction in cardiovascular events, especially in patients with atherosclerosis in three beds. Again, these are the high-risk patients. 
Bempeduic acid is quite new in the market, at least in, in our country. How does it act? You see here the different steps of cholesterol synthesis in the liver. Bempeduic acid blocks the ATP citrate lysis, an enzyme that is not present in the skeletal muscle and thus avoiding the most common side effect of the statins. The clear harmony trial with uh, pampetoic acid lead to a further about 30% reduction in LDL patient in LDL in patient with a maximum tolerated statin dose. In another recent trial, the combination of pampetoic acid with acetamide led to a 30%, 35% reduction in LDL cholesterol as well in the high sensitive CRP. I think this combination is an important treatment option in patients not tolerating the statins at all. A quite new approach to lower the LDL is in glycerin. In glycerin is a so-called small interfering RNA. How does it act? To make the story short, it inhibits the translation of protein PCSK9, and by this increases the number of LDL receptors. The application of this new drug is easy. After an initial phase, it's applied only every six months subcutaneously. Orient 10 and 11. Europe and US and South Africa were the phase three studies in CED patients. And with a mean reduction in the LDLC levels of about 50% over four, 540 days, the effect seems to be similar to the PCSK9 inhibitors. One new approach for patients with high TG levels, the launch will be in Europe in the next month in September. With high dose of icosapent etyl, four grams per day, this is a trial, a 25% reduction in high risk patients could be shown over a period of five years, both in primary and secondary prevention. Now, how to reach these LDL targets we have now from the uh, we have now from the ESC. With the potent statins combined with acetamide or pampetoc acid, we might achieve a reduction of up to 65%, which is sufficient in, in many patients. Adding the PCSK9 inhibitor, or maybe in future is in glycerin, in combination with statin or acetamide, we might even reach a reduction of about 85% in LDL cholesterol. Many people have concerns about these very low LDLC levels. But at birth, we have average level of 30 milligram per deciliter, which slowly increases with age and then high fat diet. Thus, these low LDLC levels cannot be harmful. What about the new onset diabetes? There's only a low and clinically non-significant increase with statins, but this is not observed with the PCSK9 inhibitors. How to reach the LDL targets now in the daily practice? Statins and acetamide remain the basic therapy. And now use the high potent statins such as atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, and in the patient with a high risk start early with acetamide. The new therapeutic options are mainly reserved for patients who have side effects under the basic and the conventional therapy, and they are reserved for high-risk patients not reaching the targets with the basic therapies. And very important, inform the patient and the family doctor about the treatment targets. This will increase the compliance. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Volker. Are there questions?
Yes, I have some uh, question for Professor Cross, please. I have two questions. The first is um, the statin is not indicated for the patients with uh, heart failure. But if the patient has a heart failure and a atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and we have to reduce the uh, area of cholesterol. In this case, the coenzyme 10 has any role. Can we combine it to statin for the patients? Combine. I didn't get Co the whole Coenzyme 10. The, the, the pempedoic or the? No, the coenzyme, coenzyme yeah. 10 combined yeah. with the statin for the patients with Hypercholesterol with heart and ischemic heart disease and ischemic heart disease. Yes, that's right. Okay. okay. Um, actually, I don't know the data for that. I, I see that a lot of patients got the, uh, the, the coenzyme Q, but actually I'm not aware of, um, the, uh, of any random run trials uh, regarding this issue and also regarding, um, regarding any heart endpoints. Maybe you have more information that I, I, I don't have. We, we, see, we see it sometimes that the patient got this um, co-medication, but uh, actually I'm not aware on the, um, any randomized trial, especially in this patient indicating an additional effect. I think, of course, we have to get, we discussed it in the last session already that in patient with ischemic heart disease and um, heart failure, there are many disease in one and, and I don't know exactly or we, I think we don't know exactly how much we can really um, influence the, 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 the pro, all, already progressive uh, heart the ischemic cardiomyopathy with the statins but on the other side um, if uh, LDL lowering is, um, is, is feasible with, uh, with the instruments we have I of course I would try it and also get to this um, the lowest LDL value um, possible. Yeah. And the second question is, uh, in some patients, especially in the female patients with a hypercholesterolemia and hypertriglyceride, and when we put the statin for the patients for why the triglyceride increase. So in these cases, what is the solution? Yeah, sometimes it's, it's, it's a question what, what, um, what is the reason now for the high triglyceride in this patient? Do they have additional uh, diabetes, which is uh, most often? Otherwise, I think in, in um, most of the patients, when we redo the, and we do the, uh, the, the blood samples and the patient came come in a fasting condition, um, then in, in many of these patients, uh, we have the, uh, the lower TG. Uh, levels and of course it's also a question is this for primary uh, is a primary uh, indication for primary prevention or for the secondary uh, prevention so if the patient has already is at, at risk I would of course start with the statin because for the statin and the LDL lowering um, targets we have most of the data and um, I think then later on, changing and, and um, discussing with the patient lifestyle, nutrition, everything, we might also get the um, we get the, the, the G downs, and maybe in the future, as I saw short in the last slides, um, with the new drug not not yet on the market, and we, we don't have any experience of that with the high dose of the omega three acid, this might be an additional option for this patient with the high cholesterol and the high TG levels. In these patients, can we combine uh, a low dose of fibrate with statin? Yeah, I think this is still it is still an option. I didn't show that because um, it's um, we 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 only rarely do it, and uh, most of the patients coming with this kind of um, combinations, um, they are treated in the special outpatient clinic on the university. The patient with a really high uh, lipids and high TG, high TGs. Um, they are normally treated um, in the outpatient uh, departments for high lipids in, the, in our university hospital. So this, especially these patients with this combination, we, we, don't, we do the rarely see in our, in our daily practice. But of course, it's still an option to get down. But I think the, 
with the, now with the newer statins, um, especially now uh, the availability of the rosuvastatin as a generic drug, I think we have much more options also to get to treat the other, uh, uh, get them down. And um, only in some patients we need this so-called older uh, drugs for the uh, TG reduction and LDL reduction. Thank you, Professor. Hi, uh, can, I, can I have a question? Hi, Professor yeah. von Klaus. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm ah, fine, thank you. Nice to see you Very again. Happy to, uh, to see all of you in uh, good health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. We have uh, received many uh, uh, news from your lecture. So uh, can I have a, a very uh, a short question concerning about the uh, using of PCSK9? Yeah. Can the user uh, discuss uh, as for light therapy in a very high risk coronary patient? Because uh, normally we use uh, first as a uh, starting with high dose, but yeah. in, in case of very high risk coronary uh, artery disease. Can you use a fertilized therapy immediately? BCS can I? Yeah. So we, I, I think it it depends on the on the on the uh, on the health system. So in, especially in our system in Germany, before we start with PCSK9, anyway. before we start with PCSK9, we should we have to show that we could not reach the LDL target with both uh, statin and acetamide. So we have to do a documentation of the LDL values and uh, the possible side effect of the, of the statins. And when we have documented that the patient did not reach, there's somebody in the background. Okay. And um, when we have clearly shown that the patient, high-risk patient, could not reach the LDL target with the statin and combination with pempoid, whatever, then we can start to prescribe the PCSK9 inhibitor. So that's the way uh, we do it. And also we, we, I think we should do it because this medication is, is um, quite expensive. And um, we, on the other way, we see when we take some time and start and, and increase, for example, rosuvastatin slowly over time, that in many patients we can get this 55 uh, milligram per deciliter without a PCSK9. So we have to take some time. And um, especially in our system, we, we, we might not start in the beginning with this patient, but of course, if we do not reach, let's say about in, within two or three months, uh, this this target, um, then we start with the prescription of the PCSK9, but we don't use it as a first line. Yeah, normally not. That is that should be the exception. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are there more questions? Okay. Micro, micro, micro. Okay. Professor, okay. we have a question. Yeah. Professor, we. 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 micro, micro. We are micro. I would like to uh, ask uh, each Christian in uh, Europe, EMA accepted each Christian for usually dairy. Oh, sorry, I didn't, um, I couldn't understand for the quality of the. I would like to, uh, to, 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 to ask. Uh, the English um, do uh, usually in daily for uh, high, hypercholesterol. Huh? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't get the. He, want, he, he wants to 
to ask you about the Inclisiran. Inclisiran, okay. Yeah. Yes, Inclisiran is the treatment of the patients with high ah. cholesterolemia. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. So the Inclisiran was um, introduced in, um, I think it was int introduced on our market in, um, I think it was in November. And uh, I listened a lot of conferences, uh, especially on the treating regarding hyperlipidemia. And um, to my knowledge, they're only starting now with the Inclisiran and there are only um, uh, few experiences. So um, I think some of the people are still reluctant when they see, okay, every six months, if I have side effect, what happens? Have, do I have the side effect and for six months? Um, and on the but on the other side, I think when we we will get more data this year and the next year, and I, I think it might be an alternative to the um, PCSK9 inhibitor. Presently, we um, the, the reimbursement for the patient is not clear, but I think this will change um, in this year. So, in the presently in our country you might prescribe the PCSK9 inhibitors, the two uh, on the market, according to the condition I mentioned. And uh, for the Inclisiran, um, we have still to wait for the, the, the green light from the insurances. So um, up to now, the experience are really uh, limited. Uh, but, but what I heard from the colleagues in the special ambulance outpatient clinics in the, in the university, up to now, they had um, successful, um, treated only some patients, but um, yeah, without any side effect. The side effect from the studies are on the placebo niveau, like for the PCK9 inhibitor. So I think it's a promising uh, therapy that the cost of the therapy are still more than the PCSK9 in our country. But I think it's a question of time um, until uh, this will might change in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we have to. Um, I think I have to. We have to move on now with uh, with the program. And um, I would like to introduce the next speaker, this Professor Bernd Lemke, um, and he will talk um, on pacemaker therapy. Uh, very interesting title: the alternative pacing sites. Okay. Please, Professor Lemke, you might start with your presentation. So we can see the slides. You are not, you have to um, unmute your um, um, microphone, Professor Lemke. I think you, you are muted at the moment. We cannot hear you. And now? Okay, now it's perfect. Thank it's you. Perfect. Now so, I can see you and I can hear you. Yes. And I think, okay. Okay, Please. Dr. Klaus and Dr. Nguyen, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure for me to be again part of the Vietnam German uh, Congress. I hope we will meet us again next year. But uh, in the moment, I give you a presentation of pacemaker therapy. And the topic is alternative pacing sites. Um, uh, but it doesn't work. Why, why it doesn't go further? Yesterday it works. Ah, can you, can so so you, I go manual here in my presentation. Um, why alternative pacing sites, right? Ventricular epical pacing has been well established for more than 60 years. Nevertheless, it does not restore the physiological excitation of the heart, but turns it upside down. It is comparable to ventricular arrhythmias from the apex and the left bundle branch block. While some of the patients survive this non-physiological stimulation for years without damage, other patients develop pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy. Kershit retrospectively studied to 1,750 consecutive pace, um, pacemaker implantation between 2000, um, 2000, 
I have to make it a little bit, yeah. Three and 2012 of uh, 257 patients with frequent uh, RV pacing, 20%, 20% developed pacemaker and use cardiomyopathy with a decrease of ejection fraction from 62 to 36% over 3.3 years. Therefore, the search of alternative stimulation sites is old as pacemaker therapy. The figure of Arnold illustrates the current landscape of terminology and anatomy of conduction system pacing. Let us start with the most established alternative stimulation site outside the specific conduction system, the right ventricular septum uh, stimulation and the biventricular CRT. With normal pacemaker implantation, more than 50% of the electrophysiologists prefer a septal position for the RV electrode, anatomically guided without electrophysiological measurements. The results are contradicting with a slight tendency in favor of septal stimulation. Here we have a typical example of a mid-septal placed electrode in PR and LIO angulation. With the mid-septal stimulation, we do not achieve a normalization of the QRS complex. However, as in this example, and with a little bit luck, we can achieve a narrow QRS complex. In the first randomized controlled trial with CRT, an endocardial stimulation with endocardial stimulation, the MASTIC study, we place the LV electrode in a posterior septal position and the right ventricular electrode in a mid septal position. The reason was to achieve the longest possible interventricular delay and thus an optimal resynchronization. Before large endpoint studies, we were able to demonstrate a benefit in clinical parameters. In a more recent electrophysiological study, we have shown that the interventricular conduction delay is longer with the septal position of the RV electrode compared with an apical position. It therefore makes sense to place the RV electrode septal as part of CRT. Left bundle branch block, leads to a mechanical dyssynchrony with shortening filling time, increased mitral regurgitation, reduced ejection fraction, and neurohumoral activation. With CRT, we can treat the left bundle branch, induced cardiomyopathy. As you can see, the synchronous contraction is achieved immediately with biventricular uh, stimulation. The prognostic effect of CRT could be demonstrated in a number of controlled trials with more than 10,000 patients. The study showed an improvement in functional capacity, symptoms, and LV function, but also in a reduction of heart failure hospitalization and all cause mortality. Derived from these studies, the guidelines give us recommendations with strong evidence. This includes patients with left bundle branch morphology and a class one indication of the, um, if the QRS uh, width is more than 150 milliseconds. And in the new guidelines coming, where will be published at the ESC Congress at the end of this month, there's only a class 2A indication if the QRS width is between 130 and 150 milliseconds. On the other hand, we have indications for patients with non-left bundle branch morphology, with the exception of patients with a QRS width of more than 150 milliseconds, there's only unclear evidence for the other indications. This, is also, this also applies to patients with permanent atrial fibrillation and to patients with pacemaker indication. An alternative to septal stimulation and perhaps also to CRT is the conduction system pacing, especially the His bundle stimulation. If it is possible to, stimuli to stimulate the His bundle directly without exciting the surrounding myocardium, we speak of a selective His bundle stimulation. If the surrounding myocardium is stimulated together with the His bundle, we speak of a non-selective His bundle stimulation. 
I did my first T bundle stimulation at the end of the last century in a patient with atrial fibrillation after a V node ablation. 12 of 12 ECG leads under stimulation showed an identical QRS morphology as intrinsic. The X ray shows the position of the atrial electrode and the His bundle electrode. In 2000, Deshmukh published his result with his bundle stimulation. He described feasibility of permanent his bundle pacing in 12 of 18 patients and had uh, two lead dislodgements, long operation and fluoroscopic times, and a success rate of only 50 to 60% prevented a breakthrough of this therapeutic method in this time. That changed with the development of specific delivery sheets and electrodes. The first performed sheets came from Medtronic together with a thin electrode who is placed over the sheet without a guide wire. Now steerable sheets are available and all companies provide delivery sheets and his bundle leads. Let us start with a case report of a his bundle stimulation in a patient with a PR prolongation. A 65 years old male with recurrent dizziness, dyspnea, and normal EF, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and sinus bradycardia, and a an first and second degree AV block. The problem with this rhythm constellation is that DDD stimulation leads to permanent right ventricular stimulation and algorithms for reducing RV stimulation do not work here. In the first position, we have a nearly normal QAS complex, but the His bundle stimulation is non-selective, visible in the ECG by the small delta wave that follows the stimulation artifact. In the second position, a little bit more cranial than the first, there is a selective His bundle stimulation with an isoelectric line between the stimulation artifact and the narrow QAS complex. In an intra-individual comparison, Keen demons determined the hemodynamic effects of the three stimulation modes in patients with PR prolongation. As you can see, the best hemodynamic results are found with his DDD stimulation, while with RV stimulation, the systolic blood pressure decreases compared to the intrinsic rhythm with the long PR interval. On the right side, you see the effect of an RV optimization that is possible with his DDD pacing. With a prolonged AV delay on the left side of the, this slide, um, you have a fusion of the E and the R wave in the mitral valve Doppler. By optimizing the AV and the, uh, the uh, AV time, the A and the A wave separates, bringing the A wave close to the ventricular contraction, in this way reducing diastolic mitral regurgitation and improving cardiac output. In, in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and a, a V node ablation, his bundle pacing normalized the ejection fraction over time, whereas in patients with a preversed preserved uh, ejection fraction, there is a slight increase in ejection fraction and no decline. Um, a decline is typical in uh, RV pacing after RV node ablation. In uh, this case control study of Abdal Rahman, all patients requiring, requiring initial pacemaker implantation between 2030 and 2060 were included. Permanent his bundle pacing was attempted in consecutive patients at one hospital and RV pacing at a sister hospital. Primary outcome was a combined endpoint of death, heart failure, hospitalization, or upgrade to biventricular pacing. 765 patients were included and a mean with a mean ejection fraction of 54% and a mean follow-up time of two years. There was a significant decline of the combined endpoint in all patients with his bundle pacing, especially in pacing with more than 20% ventricular pacing. But remember that it's not a prospective randomized uh, 
The study saw the new guidelines rate the evidence of his bundle pacing and pacemaker indication as a level C and give a 2B indication only in patients with an injection fraction of more than 40% who are anticipated to have, have more than 20% ventricular pacing. We come to his bundle pacing in left bundle branch block. How is that possible? Abed Hay uh, performed detailed intracardiac mapping of left septal conduction to access the presence and level of complete conduction block in the hispokinia system. A left intrahistian block was found in 46% and a QRS correction by pacing was possible in 94% of these patients, nearly 100%. In um, 80%, the block was localized in the left bundle branch, of which 62% a QRS correction was feasible. In 36%, the block was distal located without a possibility of QRS correction by pacing. In the next case report, I show you a 56 years old male in your class three and an ejection fraction of only 28%. He had a left bundle branch block with a QRF width of 172 milliseconds. The intracardiac electrogram over the pacing electrode showed a his potential and a left bundle branch morphology. In the picture in the middle, you can see the stimulation site below the block. A stimulation from this point results in a short QRS complex. The 12 lead ECG gives you the picture of selective his bundle stimulation with a QRS duration of 90 milliseconds and a pacing threshold of 0.75 volt. In another patient with his bundle stimulation and correction of the left bundle branch block, you can see the same effect of resynchronization as we saw in the beginning video with biventricular CRT. In a long-term follow-up study, his bundle pacing showed a stable increase of ejection fraction over time, but this has the price of a high stimulation threshold of average 2.3 to more than 3 volt. The new ECG G guidelines therefore recommended in CRT candidates in whom coronary sinus lead implantation is unsuccessful, a class 2A indication for his bundle pacing. Beside his bundle pacing, a new procedure was developed, left bundle branch placing. The site suitable for direct stimulation of the left bundle branch lies below the bundle bifurcation it can only be reached by a penetration of the septum. Huang first described the effect of left bundle branch pacing. On the left, you see a left bundle branch block with a QRS duration of 165 milliseconds. On the right, you see a stimulated QRS complex with a QRS width of 104 milliseconds. A, success, uh, a successful left bundle branch pacing results in an incomplete right bundle branch block configuration with a small QRS complex. In the middle, you see the left bundle branch placing lead, which lies below the his bundle lead and is penetrating the septum. Huang recently published a comparison between his bundle stimulation, left bundle branch pacing and biventricular pacing. The highest reduction in QRS duration was observed under his bundle pacing and left bundle uh, branch pacing and conduction system pacing showed a higher ejection fraction improvement and a greater response than biventricular pacing. So let me conclude. To avoid pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy, do not stimulate from the apex, from the right ventricular apex. Um, his bundle pacing could be an alternative for patients with PR prolongation, permanent atrial fibrillation and V-node ablation, and patients with pacemaker indication and an expected high ventricular stimulation rate. In patients with heart failure and left bundle branch block, 
biventricular CRT have been demonstrated to relieve heart failure symptoms, re reduce mortality and improve, improve clinical outcome. Conduction system pacing could be an alternative for patients with heart failure and ventricular dyssynchrony, especially when effective biventricular CRT is not achievable. But his bundle, his Pokinia system pacing demonstrates promising results, but there are no big uh, controlled uh, randomized trials and only short follow up in most studies to support it for a first line therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lemke, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. I think there are really new um, now indications upcoming, seeing all, all, all the data and uh, maybe the success rate with this new patient pacing site. So um, what is now the success rate for his middle pacing? You showed in the beginning, maybe 20 years ago, that the uh, success yes. rate was quite low. But where, where are we now with the new methods and catheters? And uh, yeah. Um, we are now over 80%, I think. Okay. And um, so I, I think it's a possibility uh, for a normal indication, yeah, in patient with uh, total V block or for, uh, especially in patients after a nodal ablation, or one indication is not um, uh, focused in the guidelines that the, uh, the patient with a prolonged PR interval, uh, I think that is a good indication for, um, uh, for his bundle stimulation. Mm -hmm. But in the, um, in the field of, um, uh, of uh, broad QAS complex and uh, dyschronchrony, of the left ventricle, I think uh, CRT has so high evidence that it needs uh, more studies to be uh, equal in, in, um, uh, with, with his bundle stimulation. And uh, in these patients, it's only possible to have an, um, um, a reason chronization, I think in 60%, not more. Mm -hmm. And what are the, the reasons why the success rate is eighty percent and not ninety nine. What is uh, yeah? Um, that is out of the of the morphology. Um, when you have a normal AV block, it's mostly pros uh, proximal blocked. So you can reach with an his bundle stimulation um, mostly uh, the um, distal uh, Purkinje system and make a physiolo physiological stimulation. In a bundle branch block, um, you have only in 60% approximal uh, blockation. Uh, in the other cases, it is distal and it's more complicated to become a small QAS complex. So th that is the reason why Huang um, uh, developed the bundle branch um, pacing. Um, he, he was very successful in doing so. Um, but we in, uh, in, in Lüdenscheid in Germany, we start with this uh, uh, and uh, we were not so successful with the direct bundle branch uh, pacing. So I have not uh, much uh, personal experience about mm. that. Uh, but it could be in the future, uh, maybe an, uh, 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 a method uh, to solve the problems um, of direct simulation. Is there a higher complication rate also, or only a lower lower success rate? Um, you can, when you go too deep in penetration with the electrode, you make a perforation of the septum, and if yeah. this could make uh, um, uh, problems in longer term, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, we test. Okay. Other questions from the from the co chairs or from the from the audience. Very interesting subject. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pro uh, Bonka Gloss, Presentation uh, Pacemaker Therapy, Alternative uh, Patient Science. Uh, in uh, uh, the presentation about right ventricle patient and his bundle patient uh, in uh, half healthy and PR progression. Uh, now, I, in Vietnam, uh, his bundle patient, uh, very, um, can, can very, um, Successful rate about eight uh, percent, 
Now, I would like, uh, can you tell me about uh, successful race, about bundle, bundle, uh, basic maker, bundle basing, uh, because uh, bundle basing uh, have a, uh, have a um, uh, outside, uh, per, per, uh, outside uh, position. Uh, and uh, can you tell me about uh, step procedure, procedure burn, burn, uh, uh, his bundle, uh, step and step? Can you tell me? Um, in Germany, I think uh, the, the percentage is um, below 8%. Uh, we, we were really in Germany starting uh, with uh, this procedure and we adapted uh, this procedure in our quality uh, procedures in Germany. We have to do a uh, national wide uh, registry of the procedures and it is now included the his bundle stimulation. I cannot give you the exact number now. Uh, I have to wait for the next year when, when we have the first data about it. Uh, but I, I think we, it is less than 8% in Germany now. And with bundle branch pacing, um, the most uh, centers um, are <coughs> begin, uh, are at the beginning in Germany. Yeah, so it's a very, very individual experience what we have. And my experience is not so so great. Um, uh, I have have had a problem to to penetrate the septum. It was not possible in uh, in many cases to stabilize the the, um, the guiding catheter at the septum and to penetrate uh, the the electrode. Uh, so um, I don't reach uh, the specific um, conduction system on the on the left side. But I, I think theoretical and the, the, um, the data uh, from China are very good. Uh, I think that is a method we have to, to look for, yeah, to give, have more experience and maybe then a higher success rate, uh, rate in this field. Thank you. One more short question. Is there... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Pan from the Hanoi Hospital. Yeah, uh, in fact, that in Vietnam, uh, when we do the his bundle testing, is it uh, more cheaper than compared with the CRT, and then the the cost is only half compared with the CRT. And then you think that uh, his bundle testing can can replace own for the you know CRT or not? Um, his bundle pacing is possible. Um, uh, 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 as an alternative to CRT, I think in 60% of the patient. And uh, my friend, um, um, uh, Carsten Israel in, uh, in Bielefeld, he has much experience about this. Yeah, We do it only as a second line therapy in patients with a CRT indication. Maybe I'm a pioneer of CRT therapy and um, uh, for this um, to switch to another method is not so easy. But when when you not able not able to uh, place the uh, electrode in a coronal sinus vein, um, then we at first go to uh, try uh, to make an his bundle stimulation before we uh, make an indication for an epicardial um, placement of the electrode. Yeah, okay. in fact, that when we do the, the, the his bundle testing, some case we, we can fail. Yeah, I think yeah. that about 10% we can fail, right? And then uh, almost case we, we not get a successful. And second okay. question about the uh, okay. neck bundle branch uh, testing. Yeah, we saw a lot of data from the China. Yeah, yeah. About the, you, know, you know, that can improve the heart failure. Yeah, but uh, what do you think about, about you know, that's the, the future of this? Yeah, we have to reproduce it. Yeah, that's that's really good. Good data is they presented, but there is no other center now um, who has the same experience, the same data. So we, we have to to look if it's possible to reproduce this data. Yeah, because some K some K I, I try to do in the lab the uh, prints uh, testing, but not easy, and uh, it spend more time. And some, you, you know, that more the trouble shooting than I, I do the, the his pandemic. And then uh, yeah. I don't know about the, the, the result of it. 
Okay. okay. Thank you very much for the uh, discussion. I, I, Professor Demke, thank, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Maybe we got to get an update next year. And uh, now we uh, move on to um, Dr. Kwang about the interventional therapy of agile fibrillation, state of the art uh, 2021. So dear professors, colleagues in Vietnam and Germany, again, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this uh, symposium here of the Central Vietnam. And uh, today I want to talk about the interventional therapy. It's my, my daily routine here in St. Vincent's Hospital in Cologne, the interventional catheter ablation therapy of atrial fibrillation in 2021, state of the art. So you all know that in 20, 2020, there's an update in guidelines of the ESC in uh, uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation. And uh, you can see here that catheter ablation, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary vein isolation is a clearly class one indication, also in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent fibrillation, and also in persistent atrial fibrillation with major risk factors. And now what is the cornerstone of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation? You all know the STAR AF2 study and this study have compared ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, have divided the patients in three groups. And you uh, can clearly see here that all the three groups have, to have had the same outcome, whether you do an only pulmonary vein isolation or added some electrogram ablation or line ablation. So actually, the complete electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins, the so-called PVI, is still the cornerstone, is recommended during all catheter ablation procedures. Now, um, in, in the um, de development of the therapy of atrial fibrillation, there seems to be one subgroup of patients uh, who will clearly, uh, um, uh, who will clearly uh, get benefits from catheter ablation is these are the patients with heart failure. And I want to present the study, the so-called camera MRI study. And this study have compared catheter ablation versus medical ray control in atrial fibrillation in patients with systolic dysfunction. And uh, these studies have concluded that there's additional benefit of catheter ablation despite sufficient ray control in these patients. So there were uh, included were patients with persistent atrial fibrillation with reduced ejection fraction below than forty-five uh, percent, and you can clearly see these all these patients were good uh, um, heart rate controlled, and after catheter ablation, you see an increase in left ventricular ejection fraction from more than eighteen percent in the catheter ablation groups, uh, comparing to four percent in the medical rate control group. The authors have done the pulmonary vein isolation and also the box line, the posterior wall. And, uh, the results uh, confirm that the results are from the Marouche study, the so-called Castle AF study. And this was the first study that have shown the benefit of prognosis in patients after catheter ablation. And these are all patients with markedly reduced ejection fraction and an implanted device like an ICD or CRT. And you've seen here, that uh, concerning the combined endpoint of death or hospitalization for worsening of heart failure, the catheter ablation group is superior to medical therapy group. So that was implemented in the actual guidelines from 2020. So the guidelines mentioned that AF catheter ablation is recommended to reverse LV dysfunction if patients uh, with reduce ejection fraction and should be considered in selected AF patients with uh, have ref to improve survival and reduce heart failure hospitalization. So that is the indication for catheter ablation is widened. Where I want to show you one uh, patient here in our clinical uh, routine. This patient was coming to the hospital with the uh, uh, tachycardia more than 100 uh, beats per minute with the persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, dilated um, atria and reduced ejection fraction of uh, 32%. And it's important that after uh, 
the sufficient rate control, the ejection fraction is, it's, it's really, it's still uh, 37% and the atria are also uh, elevated. So under uh, a sufficient uh, rate control, the hemodynamic situation uh, was not improving. So we have done the uh, uh, catheter ablation. In this uh, patient, we've done the pulmonary vein isolation. That was the uh, uh, three months after catheter ablation. You see a fully preserved ejection fraction and a normalized size of the left atrium. So here you can see that there's a, uh, some kind of reverse remodeling uh, uh, concerning the atrial, the left atrium. Uh, to uh, go more in detail, you see here the spec tracking uh, of the left atrium here. And important is here that uh, in uh, time of atrial fibrillation and large atri atria, there's uh, only 3% of booster function of the left atrium. And after cathode ablation and uh, reaching the sinus rhythm, the booster function is increasing to 20%. So when to do the catheter ablation? And there are some data who shows us the uh, uh, rat rationale for early rhythm control strategy. As you all know, atrial fibrillation is a progressive disease. And there are some studies who shows us that, for example, uh, there's a 8.6 and 24.7% transition to persistent F in one respective five years. And new lab shows that there's a 20% after one year transition from paroxysmal stadium to persistent stadium and 30% uh, after one year transition to permanent atrial fibrillation. And uh, Pat Phil et al. have publicated 2017 that there's a 40 to 50% progression from paroxysmal to persistent atrial fibrillation per year. So in line of this uh, uh, publications, an early rhythm control strategy to stop a delay progression may be favorable. And so Carl and Cook have uh, uh, done the so-called a test study to investigate this topic. So that was the multi-center randomized controlled study and have included patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and they were divided in two groups. There were the radio frequency ablation group and the antiarrhythmic group. And the, um, the aim of the study is to show the progression from the paroxysmal to the persistent uh, stadium of the atrial fibrillation. And the result of the study was that there is a significantly lower rate of persistent atrial fibrillation with ablation than with antiarrhythmic drugs. So the development from per paroxysmal to persistent forms of atrial fibrillation can be delayed or stopped by an early catheter ablation procedure. So in conclusion, in patients with refractory paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, early radio frequency ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drugs in the lane progression of persistent atrial fibrillation. In line of this, uh, there was the uh, so-called EAST study published last year from the uh, Kirchhoff and uh, group uh, that was the early control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation study. And this study have uh, uh, include a large number of patients, more than 2,800 patients, 2,800 uh, uh, patients, and who were divided in rhythm control strategy and in usual care. That means that uh, the vast majority in the uh, rate control uh, group. And uh, there were screened randomized uh, treatment and there was the long time follow-up, yeah, nearly eight years follow-up. And the uh, results were impressive. The, there was a, con a combined endpoint of death of cardiovascular causes, stroke, ACS hospitalization with worsening of heart failure. There was a significantly uh, uh, superiority of rate control strategy comparing to uh, uh, comparing to usual care comparing to uh, uh, there was a superiority of rhythm control strategy comparing to rate control strategy in this um, in this study but the study was uh, there was uh, the patients were 
there was a common group of uh, rhythm control that was not a specifically catheter ablation study. But here we can see that the, uh, the, the rate control strategy may be favorable. So at the end of my talk, I want to uh, uh, highlight uh, some new technology in catheter ablation. And there, uh, as uh, to, the, uh, to now, there are two uh, energy forms that, was, that is the radio frequency uh, uh, energy and the cryothermal uh, energy who were uh, used in the vast majority of the cathode ablation procedures worldwide. But there's a, a new energy form upcoming that was the so-called, that is the so-called pulse field ablation, the so-called PFA. And um, pulse field ablation has the potential to combine a high ablation success rate with no or minimal complication. Pulse field ablation is a form of irreversible electroporation that uses the train of bipolar and biphasic pulses. So called, uh, the pulses are like some small shocks, some electroshock of high voltage, more than 500 volts, and short duration to create tissue injury without significant healing. And the mechanism of lesion formation in uh, electroporation is a function of electric field exposures as break down cell membrane. We want to reach uh, uh, the cell membrane uh, uh, damage leading to cell death. And the unique feature of pulse <laughs> ablation <laughs> tissue specificity, myocardium is very susceptible to irreversible injury, whereas the esophagus, phrenic nerve, pulmonary vein, and coronary arteries are relatively resistant to injury. That is a very important aspect that the pulse field ablation has some kind of tissue specificity. And this is the catheter this is from the um, Medtronic um, Corporation. Uh, this is the uh, circular catheter with a gold electrodes and uh, we are do some uh, kind of um, repeated uh, uh, pulses here, and all the cycle of the pulses is uh, only 36 milliseconds. And so uh, after two or three cycles, one cycle is only 36 milliseconds, it is, was possible to eliminate here all the PV potentials after this ablation with <laughs> uh, ablation. So that was very impressive uh, data that uh, you can reach a pulmonary vein isolation after a few seconds of pulse field ablation. That was a histological section of a porcine uh, atrium two weeks after pulse field ablation. You see here the, 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 the sharp, the sharp uh, uh, scar here after ablation and the epicardial effect and the, the arteries here, there were, there, there were no damage. Yeah? There was absolutely intact and so that shows that the pulse ablation is tissue uh, has some kind of tissue specificity. Now uh, Vivek Reddy have uh, uh, done some uh, uh, some work and some follow up after after patients uh, undergoing pulse ablation and has uh, shows a very uh, good safety profile with only one uh, complication in uh, more than uh, eighty percent and they have no severe uh, complications like esophageal lesions uh, or phrenic nerve, uh, uh, phrenic nerve uh, damage or pulmonary vein stenosis. Remapping these patients uh, with uh, 3D systems shows a very sharp here uh, isolation line of the pulmonary veins uh, and uh, important that the lesions at the clinical outcome is very high the lesions uh, may be uh, sh uh, should uh, may be very durable. So uh, Vivek Revy could show us more than eighty five percent of success rate after one year. So this, in my in my opinion, this is a promising uh, new feature in pulmonary vein isolation. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize. <laughs> Uh, regarding new EC guidelines in 2020, there's an upgraded recommendation for catheter ablation. 
So defining structural and functional left atrial values is crucial for individualized subset-based ablation strategies. So early rhythm control strategy may be favorable. And there's an improved outcome after catheter ablation in patients with heart failure. And concerning new technologies, the pulse field ablation PFA is a new energy form and have promising data for pulmonary vein isolation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kwong, for your presentation. And there is a perspective for early ablation uh, as compared to antiarrhythmic uh, drugs in prevention of the heart failure. But uh, what do you say um, about early? How early? Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a, a scoring system to? Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, thank you for this uh, good question. But actually, there's no scoring system because early, uh, as so we we should think about that. Uh, early means uh, as early as possible because. Okay, from the, from, the first, uh, from the first diagnosis, it's too early. But when a patient is coming and he has symptomatic atrial fibrillation and have two or three recurrences of atrial fibrillation, so you can sit with the patients and discuss about the, uh, the therapeutic uh, options. And when you know that, that the early ablation can stop or can delay the, the, the progression from, from paroxysmal to persistent in young patients, maybe the patient is uh, 40 years or uh, 40, 50 or 60 years. So you can discuss with him to ablate the atrial fibrillation after two or, or three recurrences of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. So uh, we have to discuss with the patients about effect, effectiveness and the cost and risk. So what is the risk of the ablation? So we there's have a, a, we open the there's, indication. There's a nice study uh, from, um, there's a nice uh, study from my friend uh, Chun. He has shown that, uh, that the pulmonary vein isolation with the cry balloon after three years is very cost effective. This is uh, the, uh, more cost effective than medical treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation. That was the first question. Also, uh, the, the a pulmonary vein ablation with uh, a, a, a cry balloon is very cost effective. And of course, you have to discuss the complication rate of uh, the patient. There are severe complications like a stroke, like uh, esophageal uh, injury, like uh, a tamponade. <coughs> but uh, with the new device, see, uh, for example, the, the, the cry balloon device and with the new 3D uh, systems with uh, uh, with high density mapping and uh, uh, and uh, also new catheter design with force uh, force uh, measurement during the ablation, the severe complication is actually very very low. It's uh, below than one percent in uh, in uh, normal cases with pulse atrial fibrillation, and so uh, in in this uh, so uh, so that I can summary that also in young patients, we can, uh, we can perform the atrial fibrillation with a very uh, low uh, complication rate. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Okay, yeah, one, Dr. Kwan. One, uh, one question, it yeah. was- Good afternoon, good afternoon uh, yeah. Professor from Germany. Yeah. So I would like to ask you one question to uh, Professor Ding Kwan Nguyen. So I am uh, very uh, interesting about your presentation. A lot of the, Technologies uh, uh, from the ablation uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation, and so uh, in your presentation you mentioned uh, the new uh, techniques for pulse fused ablation. So, uh, what is the disadvantage of uh, pulse fused ablation? The disadvantage. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The 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 the. Uh, I show you, I, in my opinion, there's very uh, much advantages. There are less disadvantages of this, of this, um, of this uh, new. One of the, one of the uh, possible disadvantages is <laughs> that, that you have uh, always uh, have, uh, uh, that in some, uh, in some case you have only um, a circular ablation with one energy uh, level. 
So you know that uh, in the pulmonary vein, uh, um, for example, in the left pulmonary veins, you have anterior at the rich side, you have very thick tissue, and in the posterior wall, you have very thin tissue. And with one and with one shot of the circular catheter, you have only one energy level, only uh, uh, for all for anterior and posterior wall. And so, so that is uh, maybe a possible disadvantage um, of uh, this technique. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kwang, for this overview and uh, the news, uh, the good news on um, pulmonary isolation. And we might now switch to the next speaker, with Dr. Klaus Schlotterbeck from uh, Cardiology Oberschwaben Bodensee, and he will give us a talk um, on gender differences in acute coronary syndromes. Yes, hello. Please. Can you hear me? Everything yeah. okay? Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation to the Central Vietnam Congress, Heart Congress, um, and greetings to all our friends in Vietnam. Uh, my topic is um, to speak about gender differences in acute coronary syndromes. <laughs> I will show you um, differences in pathology and in management and in presentation. First of all, um, right. first of all, um, I will show you that the cardiovascular cardiovascular disease mortality has been declining over the years. This is a very old <clears throat> a slide from um, 19, um, um, 19, 1999, and already in 1984, there was a, um, um, there was a difference is that the female um, cardiovascular mortality was declining and the men uh, um, the female was was um, was going up, and the men um, cardiovascular disease was um, declining. And <clears throat> also, especially in younger women under the years of fifty five, um, there was an in, there was an increase in hospitalization, as you can see here on the left side. Here is the the red buttons is the, the number of hospitalizations for the women which are going up over the years. And uh, um, the blue one buttons, the, uh, stable, um, the stable hospitalization rate for men um, in, until the year of 2019. Uh, uh, and also in this study from France, you can see that for women, the overall uh, acute coronary syndromes are going up over the years from 2004 until um, now. Um, we have important differences which we can discuss. And the time of presentation is different. Also symptoms are very different. The age at the first onset for the acute coronary syndrome is different. And women have uh, specific risk factors for the disease. Um, there is a specific pathology in women which we don't have normally in men. And um, the reasons for, the, for this can be the specific hormone status for female. And we have a different um, medication and different adherence. Um, This is now. This is. This has been shown in this in this registry from the U.S. H.A. registry that if we have an admission to a hospital um, with a with a, a chest pain, the diagnostic catheterization is much more done in in male than in female in this study, and also the interventions are much more um, done in in in. Um, in male than in female. Also, the coronary artery bypass grafting is much more done in, in males than in females. Um, the mortality rate over 30 days is in, in the mean 5.8, but it is in, for women, it is 
10.7 for STEMI and 4.3 um, for men, as it was shown in an ECC, EC, uh, S, um, ECG um, presentation 2018. Um, one of the reasons is that the women have a late presentation to the hospital and have much more uh, di different symptoms uh, that, um, than the normal symptoms. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we know are the, uh, the sex hormones um, appearances over lifetimes. If we see um, the estrogen um, um, have a sharp decline in the menopause, as we know, um, and, and the testosterone is only slightly decreasing. So at this point, there is a lot of changing because the, the estrogens make the vessels smoother and they lower the, the, um, the lipids and they have a much more influence on the, on the um, reactivity of the vessel walls. Um, if the estrogens uh, are, levels are falling down as in the menopause, uh, there is a, there, there have been um, there have been developments like insulin resistance. We know that the um, um, proaterogonic uh, dyslipidemia is going up. Also, there's an hypercoagulability in this uh, situation, and this all leads to a pro-inflammatory state, um, which can which can lead to um, high higher pressure. Um, hi hypertension, it makes insulin resistance, it changes the body fat, and also um, visceral adipositas has been known. And this effects on the vascular, um, on the vascular um, diseases are shown that we have a, an, up, an upgoing of strokes, coronary artery disease, and heart, heart uh, failure. If we look at the um, at the reason <coughs> at the reasons we um, we know that we have a strong non-traditional risk factors in women like depression, mental stress, and vital exhaustion. We have uh, traditional risk factors like hypertension, which is more common, as I showed you, in women with ACS than in men um, at the main, at, after the menopause. We have uh, the smoking, which is a strong, stronger risk predictor in women than in men. Um, we have a high prevalence of smoking in, in young women, which are presenting with an ACS. And other traditional, um, other traditional uh, risk factors are diabetes. It's a higher risk for diabetic women than uh, for a diabetic men. Um, we have a higher prevalence in younger women um, with ACS, with diabetes. Also, the kidney disease is more frequent in women with STEMI than in men. And then we have the uh, pregnancy-related risk. This is a uh, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, history of preeclampsia, uh, which all lead to a risk, in increased risk of um, ACS um, with specific reaction of the vessels. There are some female specific risk factors and diseases we have to know, uh, like the polycystic ovarian syndrome, the premature menopause, rheumatoid arthritis, and also systemic lupus erythematodes. Um, we know that the symptoms um, on the side for the woman are more um, different than the, the normal um, the presentation in men, that we have more uh, abdominal discomfort, anxiety, nausea, with a vomiting and shortness of breath. On the other hand, the, the risk factors for the, for the men are the strong and independent risk factors. We know the traditional risk factor like dyslipidemia, diabetes, smoking, adipositas, and the access to, to care is normally much quicker um, in men than in, in women. Um, we have female, feminine patterns of coronary heart disease, like smaller vessel diameter, 
coronary ischemia with no obstructive coronary heart disease, so-called MINOCA. I will show you this. And we have uh, um, the microvascular um, coronary disease, uh, the so-called small vessel disease, more in women than in men. And we have a more diffuse manifestation with a worse, to pro pro worse prognosis in women, as I show you here on these pictures. Below, there is a shown that there is a more diffuse arteriosclerotic um, disease in women, that, whereas uh, for men, we have a focal stenosis, which is typical. We have less calcification in women than in men, more soft, soft plaques. And the, the, one of the reasons uh, also is the vasomotorian disturbances, which can also be the reasons for chest pain without any coronary artery uh, stenosis. Um, the appearance in acute coronary syndromes normally for women are the end stemi much higher than in, in, in men, um, as shown here. And the so-called minoca is um, the myocardial infarction without coronary artery disease. And in men, we have typically the, uh, typically the presentation with a STEMI. Um, what is the um, differences of um, Minoka? It's a myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So the patient is presenting with signs of um, acute myocardial infarction is they are troponin positive. And in the, in the coronary angio, there is a non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So per definition, the, um, stenosis below 50%. And if you have this situation, you have to exclude other diseases as shown here, alternative diagnosis like sepsis, pulmonary embolism, um, cardi cardiac contusion. And this is, uh, this is very important to rule out this diagnosis. Also, we have specific diagnosis um, which can have the same presentation like myocarditis, and uh, Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, I will show you. So if you work up um, this, um, this, uh, this disease, uh, you, you, take, uh, you have to do a coronary ang angio, you have to do a coronary vascular imaging, eventually functional assessment. Um, one of eight uh, women with myocardial infection present with a minoca, and this is about 5% in the or overall um, um, myocardial infarction. This is an example. There, is a, there was a patient presenting with this ST elevation, then the angio showed no significant coronary artery disease, but when we do an OCT, you see there is a small uh, blood rupture has been in this, um, in this patient. Um, here is shown um, what are the differences in, in, um, in presentation and in, in pathology? The type 1 a ACS uh, is a so-called STEMI, uh, which is a more dominant in men with hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes. And we have here uh, the, the arteriosclerosis and the plug rupture, the typical plug rupture, and then the thrombosis. Whereas, um, the other uh, um, um, type is the so-called SCAT, the spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is more in women, um, which is associated with a fibromuscular dysplasia and also hypertension and dyslipidemia um, and, uh, or, and often smoking. Um, it's a non-traumatic, non-iatrogenic, non-arteriosclerotic separation of the coronary artery wall by intramural hemorrhagic. And we have to, uh, to do very carefully interventions because we have a false lumen and it is not very easy to intervene. So it is uh, one of the possibility is to do a conservative management. Here you can see which age uh, normally um, the woman present with a scut. It's about beginning with 30 years and it has the climate in 55 years. And we have a very, very specific um, um, NGO examples. I show you here, this is uh, this small, this is a sign of a scut 
Also, you can see here this long uh, uh, narrowing of the LED, and also here there is a, a narrowing of the LED. It is not very easy to define, um, so sometimes we have problems. And um, go back. We have here um, a, a study shown um, that the conservative, if possible, if not the main vessels are um, uh, contributed, uh, we can do a conservative management. It is has better outcome than in a acute revascularization. Um, I showed you the causes of SCUD before. Fibromuscular dysplasia is one of the main reasons. Um, also, recurrent pregnancy and uh, connective tissue disorders, systemic inflammatory disease like lupus erythematodes, and also hormonal therapy is one of the reasons. This is an example. I hope you can show that this was a um, for two years ago, a young woman presented with a, a um, scut um, of the LAD and in the follow-up also scut of the um, circumflex artery and of left main. It was very difficult to intervene, but it was a life-threatening situation. So we, we had to intervene um, LAD, uh, left main and circumflex which was done successfully in this situation. One last entity I will show you is um, this one, which was presented the first time in, in Nagawaki in Japan during an earthquake. Many patients came to a hospital with the same um, clinical presentation. You know what I mean. It is the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. The name derives from this, um, from this, um, um, from the fisherman's, um, from the fisherman, and here you can see um, that it is predominantly a disease of the of the woman um, with a climate um, in the high presentation, and we have many emotional tr trigger factors, but also physical tr trigger factors, which are very important to recognize in this situation. You know all that we have different appearances of the left ventricle. We have a typical apical a ballooning like here, and we have a other diff different um, presentation with lateral or only mid systolic um, um, apical ballooning. Um, Takotsubo is not a Benin disease. We know um, here, um, and in um, if we if we do a comparison with a normal um, acute coronary syndrome, death rate is, uh, is similar, and uh, uh, we also have a high rate of cardiogenic shock in this disease. Also, the 30-day outcome is uh, is uh, uh, has shown many uh, problems. Uh, about six percent maze. Um, in this uh, study, and also the long-term outcome is uh, not too good, and we have to have a, we have to look at these patients yearly because there is a high recurrence rate. So I will finish, um, hope just in time, with uh, one presentation which was shown in uh, in um, in uh, ESC in Paris two years ago change in prevalence of cardiovascular disease in women worldwide. And we have uh, here a presentation from 1990 to 2017. And we, it is shown that in Western countries, um, there is a decrease. This is the blue, is the decrease. And the, the yellow and red um, is, the, is the increase. And Vietnam has a, a slight decrease in these years. Um, but other countries like Russia have a, a, a high increase. Maybe um, this is also in Vietnam contributed to the, uh, to the healthy food. And this is my last presentation, my last slide. Thank you for, the, uh, for, your, um, for your taking part. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for your for the presentation and showing us the, the, the differences. Um, so it's very interesting to have this cut in the, in the high prevalency in the, in the uh, female patient. What, what is the long-term treatment when I have the patient, you saw, okay, in this 
in this case you showed where you put a stent but in other patients when you may just see okay the flow is okay like in one study and um, you don't intervene with the stent what what is the, the long-term therapy uh, yes um, difficult question because uh, there are not enough studies there in in two years ago we gave the patients um, du dual antiplatelet therapy like uh, clopidogrel and aspirin, but uh, and some studies showed um, additional heparin, low, low molecule heparin for um, a few weeks. But um, this increased also the bleeding in the hematoma. So there is a new study that the only therapy with aspirin. Um, has advantages over the dual platelet uh, uh, therapy. So there are studies going on. And I think um, uh, at the end of the next year, there should be uh, more clearness about this uh, question. Mm. Do they have high LDL or, or lipoprotein little A values more than, than other cohorts or? No, uh, lipoprotein uh, A has uh, nothing to do with these diseases. This is uh, predominantly for young men. Mm -hmm. This is uh, for, and they have normally uh, this more than the STEMI configuration than, than um, Minoka. And LDL is uh, not too high in this woman. Uh, it is a, a disease of the vessel. Mm -hmm. Of the vessel wall and, uh, and not has nothing to do with the lipids. Okay, very, very interesting. Okay, are there more questions from the audience? Yes, the... I have one question. Thank you for your presentation. And so I would like to ask them. Um, you think that the man with the hypertension is different uh, in the uh, acute coronary syndrome with the um, woman with the hypertension, or the man with the diabetes? Is different in uh, acute coronary syndrome with a uh, woman with uh, diabetes. How do you think? Um, these are the traditional risk factors, uh, which are um, um, which are which have to be treated normally in both. But if you have a, a woman with a hypertension, there is a, a more likeliness of an acute coronary syndrome than in men. So you have to. Uh, lower more um, the the um, the blood pressure in women uh, um, to optimal uh, values, and also diabetes. Uh, diabetes um, has more influence on the vessel um, with in women than in men. So also here, it is very important to do optimal treatment of the diabetes in women. And and how about the um, uh, the lesion, lesion in the coronary artery lesion, is it, is it different from the man with the hypertension and the woman with the hypertension? Um, can be, a uh, woman can have more um, di diffuse uh, diseases and also can have this, um, this uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection um, with hypertension as well as because they have uh, smaller vessels and they have the vessel wall is different and men um, have more um, the plug rupture than and the, the STEMI configuration, yes. Yeah, thank you. One more questions? If not, thank you very much, Klaus Schlotterbeck, for your talk. And uh, we move on to the last presentation given by Professor Vogt from Zürich, Swiss on aortic surgery. Please, Professor Vogt. Okay. Uh, can you see my, uh, my slide? You can see your slide and yeah. we can hear your voice. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I'm very happy uh, to see you all, <laughs> even so only uh, by webinar. And uh, of course, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, greetings to our colleagues in Vietnam and of course also greetings to my colleagues in Germany, <laughs> which are uh, a bit closer. So I was asked uh, to give a summary about aortic surgery. This is dynamic and uh, a challenging topic. I will talk about uh, the greatest catastrophe in uh, 
Uh, in aortic surgery, that's type A dissection section, then about the most extensive surgery, solo abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, uh, show you some clinical, um, so, some patients, and then with my last slide, um, I will show the, the res current results and the indication. So what you can see here, it's a typical picture of acute ascending aortic dissection, so-called type A dissection. Uh, with the hematoma in the adventitia of the ascending aorta, which you can see here. And this is a very old picture, but uh, still it's true. It's from 1972. You can see from 100 patients with acute type A dissection, 2% are going to die um, every hour. And the survival rate uh, still is about 90 to 95% without surgery. Usually uh, it's about rupture of the ascending aorta and the patients are going to die from uh, pericardial tamponade. Uh, this is uh, the cumulative mortality rate uh, distributed between acute type P and type A dissection in patients treated surgically and treated medically. Uh, you can see the, the fate of patients with acute type A treated medically. Those who, as an example, reject uh, the surgery so is quite dismal and still the best option for acute type A dissection, of course, is emergency surgery. So how you have to organize if you uh, have a patient with acute type A dissection, what we are doing is uh, we go from the ambulance directly into the operating theater, a transesophageal echocardiography, and even a transthoracic does suffice. Coronary angiography, we almost never do coronary angiography before surgery. There are about two to 3% of patients who may need some kind of coronary artery bypass grafting, which is a, a difficult situation, of course. A CT scan usually is not absolutely necessary, but in, in most patients from other hospital, CT angiography has already done, and they are referred to CT angiography. In very rare patients, we see a lot of calcifications let's say in the left main or in the LAD or the right coronary artery occluded also. And then we go for um, a preoperative coronary angiography. But usually in the majority of patients, uh, this is not uh, necessary. So there are so-called uncomplicated type A dissection. That means there is no organ malperfusion. And there are acute type A dissections with uh, malperfusion. Uh, every kind of organ uh, can have a malperfusion, and the most dramatic malperfusion uh, is visceral ischemia. So if you have uh, actually further a patient with, let's say, a loss of a groin pulse with anuria and with high lactate level, uh, there is a high suspicion that... Recording this stopped. Recording in uh, progress. Uh, ...that this patient has a, a visceral ischemia. And also patients with property, say, from dice section of the, or even occlusion of the head and neck vessels um, are at highest risk. Here you can see, um, this is the, the way malperfusion occurs. That's a eruption of the intima level into a side branch. And the side branch can still have some blood flow through the true or the false lumen, or it can be a, um, a complete uh, stop of blood. There was one patient, you can see here, the, the, the complete intima cylinder from the ascending aorta and the arch uh, was pushed down in the proximal descending aorta. Your malperfusion in type A dissection can cause any kind of symptoms. You can have a patient without any thoracic pain, but without um, pedal pulses on the left side. This can be associated with type A dissection. You can have patients with paraplegia, uh, with hemiplegia, with acute abdomen, with a stroke, or whatever, uh, with a symptom. There is no need to have chest pain, so any kind of symptom from any organ uh, which is malperfused uh, can, uh, can occur. And uh, if the patient, it's difficult to diagnose if the patient has no chest pain. But usually, if you have chest pain and some peripheral malformation, you can relate to an, any kind of artery, then you have to suspect uh, acute type A dissection. So don't miss the diagnosis, very important. Still, we see a lot of patients in whom the diagnosis um, has been missed. Chest pain, radiating and wandering along the vascular tree is important. Of course, you have to check for malperfusion. As I have mentioned, chest and some peripheral, peripheral sign um, of decreased perfusion, look for type A dissection. 
and um, most patients uh, are diagnosed with acute myocardial infarction. And then the problem is uh, before the correct diagnosis is made, they get some kind of aspirin and clopidogrel or even more. And then um, it's found out that they have a type A dissection and then come to the operating thyatris, thrombocyte uh, inhibitors, or uh, even with NOAX. So how much surgery should be done for acute type A dissection? I guess in an acute situation, if the patient is in cardiogenic shock or so, if he has a severe um, aortic regurgitation, or if he has a tamponade, the minimal amount of surgery uh, you should do is here on the left upper to save patient's life. Of course, if um, the intimal tear is in the aortic arch or so, um, uh, more extended surgery is necessary. Um, but usually the more extended your surgery in the very acute setting, um, the higher is the mortality rate. And the mortality rate is also higher if you have an optimal transporting system. If your transporting system referring patients to you is optimal and the, the time lag between first occurrence of pain and uh, median stenotomy is short, the higher the mortality rate. Because if this time lag is more extended, patients which are unstable in cardiogenic shock, and so they already die. Here you can see one patient. This was an 89-year-old patient. On the left side, you can see the CT scan at entrance. She was 89 years of age. She did not have any kind of malperfusion. The aortic valve worked well, but it was acute type pay dissection. And what we decided without cardiopulmonary bypass, just to do a wrapping of the ascending aorta. She survived. And here you can see, this is uh, three months after surgery. The patient is quite well. Still, of course, there is an intimal flap, but still there is a chronic dissection now. You can see how the ascending aorta developed after wrapping. So in very high risk patients and in very old patients, it is feasible to do a wrapping of the ascending aorta and maybe part of the proximal arch. There is one series and the one year mortality rate in these patients have been 6%, which is favorable. So it's not always necessary to operate uh, in the even very old and very high risk patients. So surgery for type A dissection is truly the surgeon's task. He must choose the correct surgical procedure. It is his task to restore the organ perfusion. It's very important to have a correct interoperative assessment of the adequacy of body perfusion, and he must take immediate action in case of malperfusion. He has to continue to eliminate malperfusion wherever in the arterial tree this is. So there is no way uh, to defer the patient to the in in intensive care station, even though there would only be an ischemic lack because uh, there may be subsequent myonecrosis, subsequent renal failure, and together with emergency surgery, this can later on kill the patient. So um, all over the body, the perfusion must be restored. Type B dissection, of course, mainly is a medical or endovascular treatment. Um, here, just one slide where you can see the indications for emergency surgery in type B dissection is free rupture, is malperfusion. Of course, you are going to correct that, uh, the place of malperfusion. As an example, if you have type B dissection and loss of a groin pulse and an ischemic leg, you don't go for surgery on the thoracic level, but you eliminate malperfusion of the leg. And what you are doing, you are going to do as an example, femoral, femoral uh, crossover bypass, which can even be done in local anesthesia. So the coarctation persists in pain, paraparesis, and, and hematothorax are uh, the relatively rare indication to go for acute surgery in type B dissection. It's not yet clear, you can see, um, Unnecessary emergency surgery in type B dissection has the, the lowest survival. And there are two options, endovascular treatment and medical management. So it's not yet clear what is superior. And what we do with acute type B dissection, usually we do medical treatment with beta blocking and uh, with beta blockers and observe the patient. So another topic is ascending aortic aneurysm. On the left side, you can see here a 20 year old patient who 14 days ago had bilateral um, uh, operations on the on varicose veins on the leg, and that had not been diagnosed, and he came back after 14 days. And this is a typical morphonid aorta with a proximal aortic um, aneurysm. 
So there are many procedures, of course, how um, you have to choose uh, for ascending aortic aneurysm. Uh, you can uh, save, you can do either aortic valve repair or aortic valve replacement. Uh, an option is uh, aortic valve preser preservation, even with Tyron David or with Jakob operation. And there are also other type of operations like the Florida sleeve operation. According to the extension of the aneurysm, so you can see here, you can even replace the entire arch. You can do here an anastomosis on the proximal descending aorta and uh, leave an elephant trunk in place, which can later be catched uh, if you're going to stand to descending thoracic aorta. Here you can see a composite graft replacement on the left side. Here you can see this is a, a Jakub operation, which is valve prefers in, uh, uh, preserving surgery. Uh, in patients with um, very extended uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm, where you can, which you cannot clamp and which are continued in the proximal descending, uh, a nice choice is the so-called Dodaflex hybrid stent graft. Here you have a stent graft in the proximal descending aorta, and you are going to reconnect um, the arch vessels, and you can even, of course, replace the ascending aorta. Here you can see one patient, 64 years of age, she had repair of type A dissection three years ago, but then later on, she developed first rupture of the distal anastomosis to the aortic arch. She developed a huge pseudoaneurysm, uh, which was on the left posterior side, uh, dorsally, and there was a compression and even an obliteration um, of the left bron principal bronchus and on the left pulmonary artery. And um, of course, functionally, she had only one lung. And uh, what we did, uh, we did replace the ascending aorta and put the toraflex prosthesis in this patient. Now, uh, the most extensive surgery here is the. Um, so the replacement of the thoracoabdominal aorta, even though a large part of patients can be also treated uh, by stenting. And of course, there are still um, two major problems. This is ischemia during surgery causing paraplegia or renal failure. There are certain, um, a certain strategy or tactic you have to look for. Now, of course, um, you have to check the heart if there is coronary artery disease because there is an immense increase of cardiac afterload, an increase in cardiac work during the clamping period. Uh, if you declamp, it's an ischemia because the patient can have a low blood pressure. Um, there are several adjuncts how you should look um, for the spinal cord here. Uh, you can do shunts, you can uh, use a cardiopulmonary bypass with a hypothermic circulatory arrest, uh, but most uh, today do a, a isolated um, perfusion of the renal visceral arteries and even um, sometimes of the intercostal branches. Most important is an, um, a correct drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid. I guess that the introduction of the cerebr uh, cerebrospinal fluid drainage um, which starts um, together with surgery and which is extended into the post-operative period is one of the measures which has uh, dramatically reduced the incidence of paraplegia uh, to a very low two to three percent of patients. Even though the pa you have already removed the first or second day of the surgery is drainage and the patients um, show some signs of recurrent uh, paraparesis, you are able and you should reintroduce the cerebrospinal fluid drainage and even patients with paraparesis or paraplegia, they can recover and can um, be discharged with normal distal neurology. Here you can see one picture. This is the anastomosis to the distal to the distal aortic arch, distal to the left subclavian artery. And here you can see the anastomosis to the to the visceral artery, here is the bifurcation prosthesis, which is going down to both iliac arteries on the left and on the right side. And um, you know the paper from Nicolas Kuchukos, of course, who is doing everything in profound hypotherapic circulatory arrest. Uh, of course, uh, this is very specific, but he can compete uh, with the results with those who are doing moderate hypothermia with cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, like, of course, one of the giant of this kind of surgery with uh, Joseph Coselli. Um, sometimes we see patients who have a discalcific depots according to Montgomery class four or to class four with Ribakova who have these descending plugs also in the ascending aorta, 
who have some anticoagulation or aspirin or Plavix, but continue uh, to make uh, cerebral embolism in these patients. We develop a surgery, which is um, thrombent arterectomy of the ascending aorta and of the arch. And um, we did a series of patients Later on, we did an MRI to look uh, if the ascending aorta the arch is dilating or not, but we could prove that the end arterectomized segments remain stable. So this is for rare patients with um, continued cerebral embolism because of uh, protruding plugs in ascending aorta and arch uh, who do not respond to thrombocyte aggregation inhibitors. Another uh, a nice operation is the so-called ascending, descending uh, prosthesis to the in, intra-abdominal supraceliac uh, aorta for patients who had a coarctation. Maybe they had surgery as a child and they have recurrent coarctation. Maybe they already had one or two reoperations and the left chest. And then it's better to do an, a prosthesis from the ascending aorta. You can see here at the heart and here you can see the liver and you can see the, the supraceliac uh, segment of the intra-abdominal aorta. And of course, these patients, we have had two patients after 20 years, they came back with an, an aneurysm of the ascending aorta, where the connection of the ascending descending uh, graft was. This was one patient I, I operated, I guess, 22 years ago in the University Hospital in Zurich, and now I, he came back and we uh, did replace the ascending aorta. This uh, is a very, very rare patient uh, which I had operated in Myanmar, but I can show you. This was a high speed um, horizontal, um, high speed trauma and um, the patient developed this aneurysm. Uh, he came with dyspnea and what he had found was rupture, rare rupture of the ascending aorta. The patient could survive this because there was a huge pseudo aneurysm and rupture was uh, prevented by the, by the very thick anatitial layer, which usually is going around the ascending aorta and the pulmonary artery, which is quite thick in young patients and it's prevented uh, death and ex immediate exsanguination of this patient. Here you can see another nice um, picture of a patient I operated uh, on recently. This is a sinus vasalva aneurysm here. And you know you can see here prolapsing into the right ventricular outflow tract. And mainly this patient had dyspnea and um, there was a pressure gradient of more than 50 millimeter mercury in the right ventricular outflow tract. He was happy that this was not ruptured. Um, so you can see here, there is the variety of um, aortic <coughs> surgery you can do is enormous. Uh, this is a patient here with an, an, an aneurysm of ascending aorta arch and descending was impossible to put a clamp. So we did this clamshell incision. It was a reoperation to replace everything in one stage. Another important point is aortic infection. Here you see a pneumococci um, aortitis or a mycotic aneurysm of the proximal descending aorta above the, above the diaphragm. Uh, this is a patient which ruptured into the left lung. This is an intranial mycotic aortic aneurysm. And this is a ruptured um, intranial mycotic aneurysm which ruptured in the spinal cord. Um, so we operated on a large series of patients. Usually we used homographs. And this was a patient who had a previous surgery with composite graft replacement, replacement of aortic arch and elephant trunk. And he suffered from this mycobacterium chimera endocarditis, uh, which is a bacterium which is located in, located in the heater and the cooler machine, uh, which caused a lot of troubles, which uh, fortunately had been eliminated. This was a, uh, a very rare indication. Of course, there are complex hybrid procedures. You can see here, this was replacement of the ascending aorta and arch, re-implantation of the head and neck vessels. And in the same time, um, we will be prepared an entry into the infrarenal uh, aorta and did in the same setting, uh, did the stent the descending thoracic aorta. What you also can do, you can do 
an aortic debranching of the head and neck vessels. And in the, in, in the abdomen, you can do an uh, ortho uh, visceral renal debranching and bring all the, the, re the perfusion of the renal arteries and of the celiac trunk and of the superior mesenteric artery to a bifurcation prothesis. And then you are able to stent the entire thoracoabdominal aorta. So you can treat a complete thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm with this technique by just a simple uh, uh, median laparotomy. So what are the current overall results? I guess that elective replacement of the intrarenal aorta should have a mortality less than 1%, emergent uh, between 5 to 10%. The replacement of an aneurysm of the ascending aorta, regardless if you are also going to replace the aortic valve, if you do concomitant cabbage, or if you are doing an open anastomosis of the arch, if it is elective, the mortality rate is less than zero, less than 1%. Type A dissection, it depends. If it's uncomplicated with all, without mold perfusion, the, currently the mortality may be as low as 5%. If it's more complex together with neurological symptoms already preoperatively, it may be up to 15 to 25%. Then elective surgery in the descending thoracic aorta, 5%. Uh, emergent 10% and surgery for thoracoabdominal aorta uh, has today a mortality between five to 10% and hybrid treatment for these kind of patients you have shown uh, two cases uh, in our hands so far had a mortality of 5%. So overall there are markedly improved results <laughs> over all aortic segments, a decreased morbidity with regard to uh, post-operative stroke and paraplegia. You can do combined surgery, stents and hybrid are welcome, and you can reduce the amount of surgery. And what is very important, you have to think more about prophylactic surgery according to the uh, recommended diameters and not um, leave the patient into emergency surgery. So of course, um, the indication for surgery depends on the absolute aortic diameter in the comorbidities, in the rate of annual growth, uh, in the patient's quality of life, and the descending and the, the surgeon's result. For ascending aorta based on atherosclerosis and the tricuspid aortic valve, I guess the indication for elective surgery, if, it, if the aneurysm is large, they're fine for if 0.5 centimeters. If there is a tissue, tissue deficiency syndrome with bicuspid aortic valve, it's 4.5 centimeter, whereas you have to calculate, particularly in atherosclerotic aortic aneurysma on the body surface area. Arch indication, 5.5 to 6 centimeter, descending thoracic aorta up to 6 centimeters. And for thoracoabdominal aorta, it's up to 6 centimeters if it's chronic dissection. It's, uh, if it's more than 6.5 centimeters. And if you have an intrarenal aortic aneurysm and it's low risk surgery, uh, it's, if it's more than five centimeter in diameter. And if you have a high risk surgery with a mortality around five to 8% or so, you can go up to 6.5 centimeters and wait until you are going to recommend surgery for the patient. So I would like uh, to thank you again for this invitation and for your attention. I will send greetings from Switzerland to Vietnam. And here I have a very, very old people, uh, a very old picture here, my memories of Vietnam. I mean, when uh, I was doing uh, surgery in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Vietnam in, in 2000. Uh, okay, so again, thank you very much for your attention. Professor Volk, thank you very much for this overview and this very impressive pics from um, the operation sites. So that uh, pics we don't see very often as um, non-surgeon, as cardiologists, I'm, I was very impressed. Are there any questions from the chairs and from the audience? So uh, I'm uh, Dr. Fu, a cardiac surgeon in Huey Center Hospital. I'm uh, very interesting uh, about your uh, excellence presentation. I know uh, the hybrid procedures, and now it become uh, popular in uh, your center. So um, I would like to uh, uh, to know uh, in uh, technique in the branching uh, procedure, combine the endovascular stenting for the complex 
thoracic abdominal aortic dissection or aneurysm. As we need, we need to do uh, the CSF drainage or uh, hypothermic uh, circulatory array uh, for surgery. Yeah. yeah. Usually, if you go for open surgery for a thoraco abdominal aortic aneurysm, particularly if you are going to replace to replace the segment above and below the diaphragm, where there are the most important intercostal arteries, I guess that the CSF drainage uh, is mandatory. Um, I mean, you can do if you are keeping organ perfusion. Uh, during surgery, of course, you can go just to 32 degrees. This is possible. But in any case, I will put in a, C a C CF drainage. If you do a visceral renal debranching, yes. and within one step, you are going to replace the thoraco abdominal aorta just by stand grafting, which is possible to do it in one Enter step. Breath, I yes. would also recommend the CSF drainage. Okay. So yes, for the one step, when we depression and stenting, we need to do CSS yes. Uh, yes. finish. You know, as, as soon as you are going to overstand uh, the segment, uh, the, I would say the eight centimeter segment above and below the diaphragm, you yeah. should use the CSF drainage. It's because uh, the, the segment, uh, the aortic segment above and below the diaphragm is the most important one uh, with regard to spinal cord perfusion. Um, usually we are going to put in the CSF drainage in the evening before surgery. Of mm -hmm. course, if you're going to puncture and then blood is coming out, I, I mean, think. you have to defer surgery, of course. Yeah. But so far we haven't had any problems, let's say we say, uh, hematoma, which had to be compressed surgically or with infection or so. It's a really a low risk procedure uh, with, a, with a large benefit for the patient. So with the mortality around 5% in high pre-procedure for the complex thoracal um, thoracic uh, um, aortic uh, dissection. And now yes. in, your, uh, in your center, you do Frequently, or so you choice uh, um, uh, 50-50? Um, um, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, of course, we have all kinds uh, of patients. If it's, if it's feasible for the patient, it can easily be done for a thoracic abdominal. Uh, we would recommend, um, if it's not a young patient, uh, yeah. we would recommend um, this, uh, this hybrid surgery. So uh, visceral renal uh, debranching, or if it's about the aortic arch, debranching of the arch vessels, and then um, it's just to prevent this huge thoracoabdominal incision. So we have lost one patient, one female patient. Mm. Um, she had suffered from a COVID infection. Uh, she had bilateral pneumonia. And then she got a infected a mycotic aneurysm just below and above the diaphragm, which right. was uh, progressively in a in, in, in few weeks, it did uh, grow about more than 1.5 centimeter. We took her in the OR, of course, there was a lot of pain she also had. She was febrile. And then we did a visceral renal debranching and, and we did a stent, okay. over stent, the, the, the aortic segment above and below the diaphragm. Everything went well, but after surgery. So the mm. patient was already extubated. And uh, one day after surgery, all, all grafts thrombosed. And um, this may be related to a most recent uh, COVID infections. You know, there are some reports in the literature about standard composite graft replacement in patients who, had, uh, who have been COVID positive uh, with thrombosis of both coronary arteries, which have been re-implanted re standard and standardized into the ascending aorta. And in these COVID patients, it's possible that even large diameter prosthesis may thrombose uh, early after surgery. And this was the only patient we have lost so far when we have done um, these hybrid procedures. Thank you, Professor Bob. Welcome. Yeah. So, some more questions. Um, Paul, I have a question. Hello. Hi, um, hi Klaus. In, in type A dissection, um, 
Is it necessary to replace always the aortic valve or uh, is there experience to repair it? Um, you know, if you have, uh, if, if the valve is working well, and if there is no specific pathology on the aortic valve, um, then you should do this so-called resuspension. You have the aortic regurgitation in this kind of patients is caused because the, the commissure between, let's say, the, the left and the non-coronary sinus is detached from the aortic wall because it's dissected. And this leads to a prolapse of the leaflet. But if you are going to resuspend um, this commissure, if you are going to glue um, the sinus valsalva portion um, and to restore the geometry of the aortic valve and you put in a supracoronary prosthesis, you don't need to replace the aortic valve. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. We are going, of course, to replace if it's a degenerated bioprosthesis, if it's calcified or something like that. But in most patients, it's not necessary. Okay. You you showed uh, in, in type in the type eighty section the, the frapping of the aorta, the images where you frapped, and how does it work? Because what what do you do with the membrane in, inside um, when you do the frapping from a yeah. technical aspect? How how does it work? You don't do, you can do the wrapping either with or without cardiopulmonary bypass. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the anesthesiologist is, is responsible to have an appropriate blood pressure. Uh, the most important step is that you have to dissect the ascending aorta from the main pulmonary artery. And mm -hmm. you have to go around the ascending aorta without producing a lesion in the, in the uh, outer adventitial layer. But then you have to, to prepare and to free the entire ascending aorta down to the origin of the coronary arteries. You mm -hmm. can do it, of course, without cardiopulmonary bypass. And you just bring a vascular prosthesis around the ascending aorta, and you are decreasing the diameter of the ascending aorta. The surgery is just outside of the lumen. You don't mm -hmm. do anything with the dissection membrane. The aim of this kind of surgery in very old and fragile high-risk patient is just to prevent rupture of the ascending aorta, nothing else. Of course, they will leave the hospital with chronic dissections. And there are a few papers and the operative mortality has been quite low. And with regard to late um, mace, so to say, the one-year mortality in, in these very, very fragile and old patients has only been 6%. And they can survive even in, in the long term having a chronic dissection. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, I might give over to Dr. Kwang. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Professor Ming, do you have some uh, closing remarks? Yeah. Uh, Professor yeah. Ming, Professor Tian. Yeah. <laughs> on, uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, Vietnamese member in uh, Hue and uh, in uh, Central Vietnam, uh, and on behalf of uh, Professor uh, Bui Duc Phu, <laughs> he is uh, present this afternoon. I would like to uh, express uh, my sincere thanks to all the uh, professor, doctor of the uh, German Vietnam Association. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have uh, the uh, occasion to meet together face to face because of the COVID-19. But uh, we hope that in the near future, maybe next year, we can gather in the city in the central of Vietnam to discuss, to drink something, and <laughs> to <laughs> have a many uh, story <laughs> to share on of, uh, uh, on of us. And once again, thank you very much for your famous, uh, for your excellent presentation. And okay. uh, hope uh, we, are, we will in good health in the next day. One again, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. 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 Thank
Uh, we uh, hope to uh, see again face to face and uh, Professor Mendo talk. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, bye bye, Professor. Okay. okay. <laughs> on 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 of yeah. us uh, are uh, vaccinated already. Already, yeah, yeah, I got two shots yeah. already. You know, I can travel where yeah. I want to. <laughs> very very important. Very important. Three three yeah. shots. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, yeah, COVID nineteen avoid us avoid us. Yeah, and uh, get us uh, free of a disease. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Goodbye. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye 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 bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Goodbye, bye. Professor Klaus. Goodbye, uh, Professor Klaus. Dr. Uh, Gerek. <laughs> Gerek uh, Klaus. Long yeah. time no see, Dr. Yeah. Gerek. Yeah. Yeah. Recording bye -bye. stopped. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. bye.